Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 161. Today's big Bible questions, who is the angel of the abyss? Plus, if I have it, should I flaunt it? So hello, friends. Happy Lord's Day to you. As has become a bit of a tradition around here, I would like to invite you to join our church live stream tomorrow on Facebook. All you got to do is go to Facebook.com, search for VBC Salinas. That's Victor Bravo Charlie Salinas. It stands for Valley Baptist Church, S-A-L-I-N-A-S. And we are broadcasting live with worship, word, and encouragement at 11 a.m. Pacific. We're going to be going through the book of Revelation. Our focus tomorrow is on Jesus' letter to the church at Ephesus, calling them to return to their first love. So, if you get an opportunity, join us live at 11 a.m. or just watch later on. That's facebook.com slash VBC Salinas. Today's scripture for the podcast is Deuteronomy 11, Psalm 95 and 96, Isaiah 39, and Revelation 9. Once again, we're going to deviate from the norm just a little bit and handle two questions for the day, which will give us two separate focus passages, Isaiah 39 and Revelation chapter 9. So let's tackle the harder question first. In Revelation 9, we are introduced to a most enigmatic and unsettling figure. He's called several things, the king of the locusts, the angel of the abyss, Abaddon or Abaddon, and Apollyon. Well, let's read Revelation 9 and shiver a little bit. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. The key for the shaft to the abyss was given to him. He opened the shaft to the abyss, and smoke came up out of the shaft like smoke from a great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. Then locusts came out of the smoke onto the earth, and power was given to them like the power that scorpions have on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill them, but were to torment them for five months. Their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it stings someone. In those days... People will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. Something like golden crowns was on their heads. Their faces were like human faces. They had hair like women's hair. Their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had chests like iron breastplates. The sound of their wings like, was like the sound of many chariots with horses rushing into battle, and they had tails with stingers like scorpions, so that with their tails they had the power to harm people for five months. They had as their king the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. The first woe has passed. There are still two more woes to come after this. The sixth angel blew his trumpet. From the four horns of the golden altar that is before God, I heard a voice say to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who were prepared for the hour, day, month, and year were released to kill a third of the human race. The number of mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. This is how I saw the horses and their riders in the vision. They had breastplates that were fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. The heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and from their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of the human race was killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke, and the sulfur that came from their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, because their tails, which resemble snakes, have heads that inflict injury. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk. And they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Holy moly, what a passage. You notice how today's big Bible question is not, what are the locusts spoken of in Revelation 9? Because I have no earthly idea. And I've never read anything that was even remotely convincing to me that somebody else had an idea what these things were. I will say this, and it's not part of uh, 
what we're focusing on today, but these um these beings, creatures, mounted troops at the end that um that were yellow, blue, and red, and had fire, smoke, and sulfur coming out of their mouths, and had tails which resemble snakes that have heads that inflict injury. I don't call me crazy. It sounds a lot like a gun to me. Like somebody who's never ever seen or even conceived a gun is going to sort of describe a, a gun or a mounted gun somehow. Uh, that sort of sounds like that to me. Again, I, this is just a total shot in the dark, a total guess. Well, the whole business of chapter nine is alarming to say the least. Who is Abaddon? Well, I don't know. And by the end of this, we won't know either, but we can at least explore some possibilities. The name itself, Abaddon of Apollyon, means destroyer or destruction. Apollyon only occurs here in the Bible, but we find the Hebrew Abaddon in a few places in the Old Testament. And I, by the way, I know some people say Abaddon, Abaddon. We'll go with Abaddon for today. If that's wrong, well, oh well. Um, I'd rather know who this individual is than how to exactly pronounce their name, because it's a Hebrew name that can be a little bit of a tough pronunciation. Uh, in the Old Testament, Abaddon is often a place rather than a being or a person. For instance, Psalms 88, 11, will, will your faithful love be declared in the grave? Your faithfulness in Abaddon, Proverbs fifteen eleven. Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord, how much more human hearts. Proverbs 27.20, 20, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, and people's eyes are never satisfied. However, there is a passage in Job where both death and Abaddon are viewed as actual entities, very similar to how Paul speaks of death in 1 Corinthians 15, as an enemy that Jesus will destroy. Job 28.22 says, Abaddon and death say, We have heard news of it with our ears. So, we can learn from this that Abaddon represents death and destruction in some way. Perhaps a clue lies in the realm that uh, Abaddon is the king of. He is said to be the king of the abyss. So, what in the world is the abyss? Well, it's a good question. This is a place that seems to be different from Hades, the Greek place of the dead, or Sheol, the Hebrew place of the dead. It actually seems to be more terrifying than that, though I admit that I'm... uh, guessing, speculating, because it's not like the Bible tells us exactly what these places are, but there's a couple of passages where it seems that Abaddon is spoken of in a different way than Hades and Sheol are. For instance, in Luke 8, the demons that Jesus ultimately cast out of a herd of swine beg not to be cast into the abyss. Interestingly enough, It is a request that Jesus grants, and it causes us to wonder exactly how in the world, uh, how bad this abyss is if demons are terrified of it. And you also sort of ask the question, why would Jesus grant the request of demons? But hey, I'm not about the business of questioning the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He knows what he's doing. It is a curiosity, though. We also read about the abyss in other passages. For instance, Psalms 140 seems to imply that the abyss is a kind of hell. Uh, Verse uh, 9 says, When those who surround me rise up, may the trouble their lips cause overwhelm them. Let hot coals fall on them. Let them be thrown into the fire, into the abyss, never again to rise. Do not let a slanderer stay in the land. Let evil relentlessly hunt down a violent man. Now, something along those lines might also be implied by Revelation chapter 20, which says in verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. Though it must be said that Romans 10 does seem to speak of the abyss in a more neutral, say, Sheol, Hades place, kind of the dead kind of way. Romans 10 says, But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this, Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. 
I'm not really fully sure exactly what that verse is communicating, but it does seem to speak of the abyss as a place somewhat different than uh, Gehenna or, or a hellish type place. Now, going further than this uh, about the abyss, the identity of a Pollyon or a Baden with any sort of confidence is going to be difficult, honestly, because the Bible is very, very quiet on the identity and purpose of this being or this place. Uh, honestly, we're not even sure if he's on God's side or opposed to God. Um, and whatever we're going to do beyond this point is going to be speculation but the fact that the Bible doesn't tell us much about Abaddon has not stopped many of the church's teachers, preachers, and theologians over the years from being very confident that they know exactly who this being is. For instance, Tychonius, he was a theologian from North Africa, lived in the 300s AD. He said that Abaddon was the devil. He said the angel of the bottomless pit is the devil who possesses his great power among the kings of the world. Andrew of Caesarea, who lived in the 500s, agrees with him. And he says it follows that the devil is to be regarded as their king, for he certainly destroys those who obey him, the king of the locust beings in Revelation 9. And not only that, more recently, friend of the podcast, Charles Spurgeon believes Abaddon to be the devil. He says... The paths of the destroyer have often tempted us. We have been prompted to become destroyers too when we have been sorely provoked and resentment has grown warm. But we have remembered the example of our Lord who would not call fire from heaven upon his enemies, but meekly prayed, Father, forgive them. All the ways of sin are the paths of Satan, the Apollyon or Abaddon, both of which words signify the destroyer. Foolish indeed are those who give their hearts to the old murderer, because for the time he panders to their evil desires. Primasius, who was a bishop who lived in the 500s AD and was also from northern Africa, just like Augustine and Tychonius, Primasius viewed this being as something like a dark angel, I guess you would say. And he said this, as king, the locusts, they have over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Armageddon, whose name in Greek is Apollyon, and whose name in Latin is Exterminans. Although God is supremely good, by head hidden yet just judgments, he nevertheless allows an angel suitable for such persons to rule over them. For a person is rewarded as servant to the one who conquered him, and so the apostle said that they had been handed over to every wicked deception because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends upon them a strong delusion that they might believe what is false and that all who did not believe the truth but consented to iniquity might be condemned. The kind of work he did, therefore, was befitting to the char character of his name, that is, the exterminator. In other words, what our friend here Promasius is saying is that uh, God uses this dark angel to punish the wicked. That's an interesting idea. Uh, the more modern poet, Alfred Lord Tennyson, no theologian, he thought of Abaddon as a demon. In fact, he wrote a poem uh, that mentions Apollyon Abaddon and says, Devils plucked my sleeve, Abaddon and Asmodeus caught at me. I smote them with the cross, they swarmed again, in bed like monstrous apes, they crushed my chest, they flapped my light out as I read, I saw their faces grow between me and my book, with colt-like quinny and with hoggish wine, they burst my prayer. So, who indeed is the king of the abyss? Who is Abaddon, Apollyon? The simple and safest and accurate answer is, we just don't know, but almost certainly a being of great power that you and I want to avoid if we possibly can. Next question, and this is going to be a short one. The world sort of says, if you've got it, flaunt it. And you can see this everywhere on social media, whether what you've got is uh, a particularly admirable body part, for instance, or what you've got is a very nice car or bling or a nice house or an incredible talent. The world says, if you got it, flaunt it. Today in Isaiah 39, we see a real life story that serves uh, us as a parable, sort of against that worldly point of view. Hezekiah is normally a very righteous king, 
But unfortunately, he flaunts his bling to an enemy king, and this decision, along with the many sins of the people of Judah, will ultimately cause their country to be utterly wiped out and their people go into exile. So let us read Isaiah 39 to find out about Hezekiah's folly. Verse 1. At that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a gift to Hezekiah since he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. Hezekiah was pleased with the letters and he showed the envoys his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the precious oil, and all his armory and everything that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his palace and in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then the prophet Isaiah came to King Hezekiah and asked him, What did these men say and where did they come to you from? Hezekiah replied, They came to me from a distant country from Babylon. Isaiah asked, What have they seen in your palace? Hezekiah answered, They have seen everything in my palace. There isn't anything in my treasures that I didn't show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of armies. Look, the days are coming when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until today will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your descendants who come from you, whom you father, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, for he thought there will be peace and security during my lifetime. So, wow, Hezekiah, a little little vain there, maybe. A little selfish, perhaps. So, should we boast? Should we show off? Should we display our bling? Should we display ourselves? I think the biblical answer is no. I read a story earlier today, and this is a little morbid, I suppose, but it was a young man who was building a bomb in his home to kill a bunch of cheerleaders. Yes, I'm not making this up as a true story. The bomb went off in his hand, which removed his hand and injured him greatly. Upon going to the hospital, asked what happened. He said he tripped and fell into his lawnmower. But FBI agents who were suspicious later searched his house and found evidence of a pretty horrible bomb explosion. One of the pictures of this guy, in fact, the only picture of this guy that I saw with the article uh, about him from his social media was of him flashing a big handful of 20s. He would have done better, I think, and so would Hezekiah had he considered some of the biblical counsel against you know, showing off, bragging, boasting, etc. For instance, Proverbs 27, 1 and 2 says, Don't boast about tomorrow, but for you don't know what a day might bring. Let another praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, not your own lips. Or how about Jesus, who said Luke in Luke 14, 11, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Or Jesus again, Mark 12, 38 through 40, In his teachings, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Finally, Jesus again, Matthew 6, 1 and 2, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites in the synagogues do, and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So, let's not be like Hezekiah and show off our stuff and boast and brag. Let's leave that business to other people and trust that the Lord will exalt the humble and will humble those who exalt themselves. And that gets us to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Therefore, love the Lord your God and always keep his mandate and his statutes, ordinances, and commands. Understand today that it is not your children who experienced or saw the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, strong hand, and outstretched arm, his signs and the works he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and all his land, 
what he did to Egypt's army, its horses and chariots, when he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued you, and he destroyed them completely. What he did to you in the wilderness until you reached this place. What he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab the Reubenite, when in the middle of the whole Israelite camp, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, their households, their tents, and every living thing with them. Your own eyes have seen every great work the Lord has done. Keep every command I am giving you today so that you may have the strength to cross into and possess the land you are to inherit. And so that you may live long in the land the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land you are entering to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated by hand is in a vegetable garden. But the land you are entering to to possess is a land of mountains and valleys, watered by rain from the sky. It is a land the Lord your God cares for. He is always watching over it from the beginning to the end of the year. If you carefully obey my commands, I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and worship him with all your heart and with all your soul. I will provide rain for your land in the proper time. The autumn and spring rains, and you will harvest your grain, new wine, and fresh oil. I will provide grass in your fields for your livestock. You will eat and be satisfied. Be careful that you are not enticed to turn aside, serve, and bow in worship to other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you. He will shut the sky, and there will be no rain. The land will not yield its produce, and you will perish quickly from the good land the Lord is giving you. Imprint these words of mine on your hearts and minds. Bind them as a sign on your hands and let them be a symbol on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates, so that as long as the heavens are above the earth, your days and those of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. For if you carefully observe every one of these commands I am giving you to follow, To love the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, and remain faithful to him. The Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will drive out nations greater and stronger than you are. Every place the sole of your foot treads will be yours. Your territory will extend from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put fear and dread of you in all the land where you set foot as he has promised you. Look, today... I set before you a blessing and curse. There will be a blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God I am giving you today, and a curse if you do not obey the commands of the Lord your God, and you turn aside from the path I command you today by following other gods you have not known. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim the blessing at Mount Gerizim and the curse at Mount Ebal. Aren't these mountains across the Jordan beyond the western road in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah opposite Gilgal near the Oaks of Morah? For you are about to cross the Jordan to enter and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you possess it and settle in it, be careful to follow all the statutes and ordinances I set before you today. Psalm chapter 95 Come, let's shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let's enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let's shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For forty years I was disgusted with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Psalms 96, verse 1. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his wondrous works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and is highly praised. He is feared above all gods. 
For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and enter his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. He judges the peoples fairly. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and all that it fills it resound. Let the fields and everything in them celebrate. Then all of the trees of the field will shout for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his faithfulness. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Dear friends, may the Lord give you a wonderful day to celebrate the goodness and grace of our God and of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good day to you and Godspeed.